Uh, welcome to the last day of um, the summer school. So um, this is, I mean, you already know in Antioch, so uh, I will just leave the floor to him for his uh, second lecture. So uh, in Antioch, uh, the floor is yours. Enjoy, guys. Great, I will. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, enjoy was to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I will enjoy as well. So now the um, so the, so let's start from last yesterday's. I mean, a couple of things from yesterday. Um, first of all, um, so the adiabatic uh, approximation remember requires you to have some sort of external uh, parameters which you control time dependently adiabatically. So here and then there's a concept called Berry phase and Berry curvature coming from that. Now we use that into our to describe our momentum space of of band insulators, basically. Right, so that's the that's the trick we are doing. So here there is no notion of adiabaticity, right? So we don't really need adiabaticity. So you you your, you can be in, actually your can you know for instance your uh, your chemical potential might be somewhere inside, right? You might even have a metal. You don't have to be in the in the band uh, level. So you would actually you could actually have some of these effects uh, laying there with you. So in fact, uh, so maybe that is uh, that is an interesting thing to mention is that uh, so if you oops, um, sorry, Just drop my phone. Um, so if you actually had this Berry curvature in a band, it, you don't even need. Um, let's see. Let me just move this. I will come back to that in a second. Um, if you had a um, if you had a Berry curvature, right? So remember we are denoting it by by this thing called omega, right? So in, in 3D, in, in, a, in a momentum from in the momentum space, you know, you might even actually be in a metallic thing. As long as you don't leave the band, you would actually feel the effects of this very curvature. And one of these effects is that it's actually, if you have it, if, if it is non-zero, and if your electron is moving around, you might have remember from your condensed matter courses, remember you actually, Ashcroft or Merman, um, I was, uh, so I, I learned, I, I learned, um, Commonest matter from Ashcroft and Merman. Um, so, you know, it's it basically, um, it will tell you that, you know, it talks about a basically a, a kind of a 19th century or, or 20th century Newton that talks about basically looks at the dynamics of, of, of particles who are living in crystals, right? So you have this band structure. So basically, you have the same thing as in Newtonian physics. So you, once you quantize, you got the band structure and so on. You try to go back, you get some sort of semi-classic description, sort of what, how does the, the particles, let's say if you have a wave packet, how does that wave packet move? And if you actually did that in the presence of Berry curvature, something that you actually is missing from most books is that, you know, you know this one, right? So typically you have the equations of motion written like this, right? So you have the, the R dot, right? That's the velocity, right? This is equal to del epsilon over del K, right? Here I'm taking H bar to zero. Sorry, H part one, H part zero would be really cool. Um, so in, I'm using units for H part as well. So that you have this does epsilon over del k. This is our usual Hamilton's equations of motion, and then you would have your k dot, right? So this would be minus del v over del r, right? That's the potential, right? And this is the base the number, right? If maybe you want to see it as like that minus grad v. That's what it is. That's the notation. Um, so not now, if you have a magnetic field, you also have minus E dot R cross D, right? So this is the magnetic field, you know, so you have the electric field in the first term, you have the magnetic field in the second term, they change your momentum and your velocity changes according to where you are in momentum space, accordingly to the gradients of the, of the energy, right? So this is the usual thing that we know. Now, if you have Berry curvature, right? And you do most of the time, you actually have a term like this, K dot cross omega. So you see that it turns, you know, so then people, you see that actually it looks like the Berry curvature looks like as if you have a, you know, you have the magnetic field in the real space that gives you a kind of a Lorentz force on the momentum. And then you actually have, looking at this, you actually have a Berry curvature in the momentum space that gives you an effective magnetic field that, that, that tries to turn your velocity, right? So it adds to your velocity. So, it, so then you have a very symmetrical thing, right? So these are the, you know, the classical or semi, classical equations. 
So here, for instance, when you have a when you're describing even quantum mechanics of a particle like this, you don't need to have any adiabaticity except that all your there is some little bit of notion left. Uh, if you want, is that you want to be stuck to that band? Okay. So this is, for instance, like this something like this. We also already assume, right? From for us, whenever we are doing this electronic things, we say that we are stuck to the electronic band. We don't do we don't do anything with the positrons, although they're there officially. They they might actually mix into our quantum dynamics. We say that you know our energy and so on is so low that we don't excite those electron hole pairs along the way. So you know that they don't affect our dynamics. This is a similar approximation. Now this is uh, case number one. So situation number two. So this is what I was trying to draw yesterday. Remember, I was talking about um, symmetries. Um, so these are basically anti-unitary symmetries. Remember, there is the time reversal symmetry. So you basically in both cases you take the complex conjugate of your Hamiltonian, right? Not the Hermitian conjugate, complex conjugate. Remember, Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So Hermitian conjugate will always be equal to the Hamiltonian, right? So there's nothing there. So it's critical you take the complex conjugate, for instance. If you have, um, for instance, an operator like the momentum, right? The momentum operator is minus i h bar del over del, this is px, then this is del over del x. If you take the complex conjugate of that operator, right? px star is equal to minus px, right? Because it's, it's complex. i in front of it would give you nine minus i. On the other hand, X would be a real operator. So remember, there are like some uh, subtleties. If you're interested, I would suggest that you read uh, Sakurai has a very nice uh, section on this explaining the anti-unitary operators in quantum mechanics. What Sakurai does not have is though, is that uh, you also have another one, right? So you take the, once you take the complex conjugate, you make unitary rotation, right? So you can, the question is, whenever you take unitary rotation to the Hamiltonian itself, that means that you have some sort of real condition in some basis in some basis, your Hamilton would be a real operator. Okay, so that's what it means. There is also a particle hole or the charge conjugation part that actually does it. You take the complex conjugate, and then you can actually use a unitary transformation or a change of basis to show that your Hamiltonian is actually that complex conjugate gives you the minus Hamilton. So that gives you some sort of uh, some sort of symmetry in the elect positive energy and negative energy excitations. And then looking at that, you would actually have the symmetry. So these are the, and then remember that whether or not you have these, you have the option that they would either square to one or they would square to minus one. You would have the, you have nine options and then you have the 10th option, which is right here. Let me just use a different color here, right here. Right, so that's the case when even though you don't have time reversal and charge conjugation, their product remains to be a, a, you know, you still have this uh, sublattice uh, symmetry. You have, a, you have the product would remain to be a good symmetry. So now, um, he, what you see here is the dimension, right? So you say that you first find out what's your uh, symmetries of your Hamiltonian, and then try to figure out what sort of topological state you might actually have. You would look into this, based at this table, right? So these are the, some of you might know this, for instance, there is the A, Right, so you can see, for instance, in two dimensions, A has can have a topological index Z. Right, so the all the insulators, when you have no time reversal symmetry, no charge conjugation symmetry, no you know based chiral symmetry, whatever, nothing, you have no symmetries left. Nevertheless, in two dimensions, you can have a topological state characterized by Z. We actually now all know the state, right? So you imagine. You have a particle, you want to break time reversal symmetry, so you apply a lot of magnetic field, right? If you have a magnetic field, ultimately you go into a, a, some sort of insulator state, um, but then that insulator is different than our vacuum. And if you have a boundary of that, uh, you know, based of that insulator with, with our usual vacuum, you see that there are actually edge states popping up. Those edge states are, and the state here we know is the quantum hole state. Right, and then the quantum hole numbers, you know, you can have any number of edge state, including zero. So this would be your topological index. Right, similarly, for instance, another example is, uh, for instance, you can see that in, in D1 and D3, for instance, have, uh, these are basically in the, that I would actually, especially gonna talk about this D and BD1. Remember we talked about BD1 in the way in the beginning, hiding it. Um, you could, you know, when we off diagonalize everything, you, you see that, for instance, you can have an index, but you can actually have any number of uh, zero modes on, on one sector, right? So that's why you get this index Z. 
you know, indeed, this is what you want to do is that you have basically we on the zero modes, right? Those zero modes will hybridize, except if you have an odd number of zero modes that even though they all hybridize, there would be, have to be one left because you have to have the symmetry of energy minus energy. And right? if you're odd number, you, that one of them has to be stuck there in the middle, right? So that's why this is where you want to be uh, whenever you're doing topological quantum computation, and that's the uh, state D. And to get that state, you have to have you have to break time also symmetry, but the charge conjugation symmetry would remain intact, right? And that is actually good because what we're going to do is that we're going to use superconductors. Good. So now, um, if there are any questions, I can. If there are no more questions, so this is from yesterday's thing, so we can continue on. Um, what am I doing on time? Actually? So now, um, the our main idea is that remember we had the zero modes, um, we had the Hamiltonian. So this is the kind of the most you know maybe we have to jump up and down a little bit around because what we have to for what we're gonna need we need we we need to have some sort of a, a slightly different language than than our usual quantum mechanics you know first quantization language right we do have to do second quantization, but you have been seeing in in you know, Özgür Hoca's and, and Jehun Hoca's and so on, and especially um, um, also just things that you were talking about, um, you, you, you were looking at, at basically a photons. Özgür Hoca is asking a question. Yes. Before you proceed, <coughs> so when you said this topological quantum communication, Özgür Hoca topological like insulators, uh, the dimensionality does not refer to uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't. Could you? So uh, when you said that uh, topological quantum computation prefers this uh, D-type topological insulators, and uh, is there also some preferred dimensionality, like one, two, or eight is better? Or yeah, that's the, that's the thing, right? So I haven't talked about dimensionality. So if one thing is that one thing to be said about the dimensionality is that you see that there's some sort of repetitive structure. That's actually a very it's an old thing called bot periodicity. Mm -hmm. um, so th these are basically, you know, you can actually, th this, these are very nice results from, you know, basically math. But uh, here, usually you talk about low dimensions, you know, one and two, two dimensions and so on. So the main idea is that you want one dimension in this. I mean, I'll, I'll actually I'll come back to this in a second. Okay, so, okay. Advise, no so we can, we can discuss that later. Thank you. Okay, so now we have to do this. Uh, you, so you have seen some creation annihilation operators, right? So you have this A's and A daggers. Now we have to talk about the fermionic versions of that, right? So that's the that's the key thing. And then we want to isolate one of those zero modes in the superconducting context. And then I, I would like to try to see, you know, what you can do with that. Um, so now the uh, typically, Okay, so that's blue, that's not really good. So now we have topological superconductors, right? So we start writing a Hamiltonian. So I'm going to just write it in a, in a, you know, in this way. So have typically an integral or whatever sum over all quantum numbers. And typically what you have is that you have a Hamiltonian in the center. This is, I'm going to assume that I have a single spin species. Okay, so there's only, let's say, upspin electrons. Okay, so now uh, the upspin electrons would have a Hamiltonian like this, right? So you have, the, you have the H, this is a single particle operator, right? Minus your chemical potential, H minus mu. So now you want to say, of course, that this multiplies uh, some sort of creation of annihilation operator H psi and then creation operator psi dagger. So now what I want to do is that I want to write a psi dagger here. So this is how you typically write a super mean field superconducting Hamiltonian. So instead of, um, you know, see how you can do this, I'm going to first write it down and then try to explain uh, what happens. Now my H here is is p squared over 2m, right? So that's my just my usual uh, good old um, one-dimensional number. Right now here as a whole, right, you have basically you can instead of looking at stuff as, as you, if you have this p squared over 2m and then you start filling up the electrons, you can actually have an equivalent way of, you might have seen this in condensed matter or many body courses, you know, you can actually look at it all from the point of view of the holes. You can say that 
you know, you fill up electrons up to here, you say, no, 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 I fill up all the holes up to from top to this point, and only the whole states that are unoccupied are, are down there and so on. And the thing is that it's, it's, it would be completely um, equivalent. So that you do here, right? So the fun thing, and that's minus H minus mu. Now, the what you what superconducts? So this this is just uh, so far. If I didn't do anything, this is I'm just basically playing games, right? I just said, oh, I have the electron picture that the electrons are dynamical, and then I have the whole pictures that are the whole can do the whole. They on their own, they're the same, and they will equal to each other. So now, what um, basically uh, um, what what superconductor tells us is that actually these two degrees of freedom are coupled, right? So that you don't knock like it's a, you, you see that they're actually um, so one thing is that they're obsolete degrees of freedom, right? You actually describe the same thing in two ways. So what does it mean that they're coupled? So it means that you have actually an operator here and delta, right? So now this is, I'm going to put a hat on top of it. So now this, what that means is that you actually, this thing is also obsolete, right? So the equivalent the outcome of this is that you will see that you only need to consider if you're looking at extensions on the positive energy states, right? So, now there is a very important thing here. So you can see that if you look at what Delta does, right, it will actually multiply, right? Uh, so for instance, you would have terms like psi dagger of X, which creates electron at point X, psi dagger at point X and the Delta, right? So if you had Delta is a constant, but this cannot be because that means that you yeah, remember this is only a single spin. You cannot put two spin electrons at the same time. Right, so remember, so this term is not possible. So the next thing that you can do is that you can do the whatever is nearby. So that would be psi dagger, right? Basically, some sort of um, um, I del x, right? Times let's say psi dagger. Right, so this would be possible. Okay. So now if you do this so the next thing what you do is that so now you have written your hamiltonian so then you call this part the single particle part and this is your full real if you want the big nice hamiltonian right remember and the main idea here is that these are fermionic states that means that they basically the only thing that you do is they're just like your a's and a daggers they create x stations and things and a psi of x would for instance annihilate a part electron at point x and they have to anti-commute Right, so you have this condition psi of x psi dagger of two daggers. If you have an anti-commutator, this would be zero. That ensures that you have fermionic statistics, right? If you have psi and psi, it also be zero. And then you have psi dagger psi. This would give you a delta function of x minus x squared. Right, so at different points, they anti-commute, but then exactly you have a condition that at the same point, they give you this condition, okay? So this is a key thing because as long as you have these operators, you're fine. So now typically what you do is, and I'm kind of, I know I'm kind of going in a crash course, but just think of it as uh, if you have any questions, we can of course discuss that later. But the main idea is that I want to see, I want you to see where that zero mode comes into a, a context like this. Right, so the main idea is the following, right? So you say that, hey, I have this single particle operator. I want to write this basically some chi n, right? And then I want to solve single particle picture operation. This is what I have been doing, right? So you, do, you solve single particle picture. Now with that, I actually, I know that from my old things, this chi n's form a complete set, right? And then you expand your field operators, psi and psi dagger, in that basis, right? So you have the gamma n times base the chi n. Let me just put on there something to show that this actually is a, is a spinner, right? Of, of, okay. So now, um, so now you, you just do this and then if you plug this in to your Hamiltonian, right? So that's the, that's the key thing. Right, so you have your Hamiltonian, let me just copy and paste it. This is your thing, copy, paste. Now the important thing here, I'm just going to be basically, I know I'm glossing over the calculation here. Um, so you want to put this 
sum instead of that. You want to put in sum oops, over n, your gamma n times chi n. Okay. And now this operator acting on that chi n would give you some epsilon n. Okay. And then you would have basically, you would have to do the same thing here and so on. Okay. So now this will give you, because you have a complete set, right? So remember this chi n's form a complete set means that chi n dagger chi n integrated over is actually is a delta function n m. Right, so using that, you can show that your Hamiltonian is something like epsilon n, gamma n, dagger gamma n. Okay. So now you have this, you, you did something like this. Well, that's really fun. But then remember, we had this, what about this particle hole symmetry? You would find out that the particle hole symmetry comes into play like this. You, if you have this gamma n, right, remember this is actually short term for gamma at epsilon n, right? You would remember because of this structure we actually had for every epsilon n, and this Hamilton has that feature as well, you have a minus epsilon n solution. So you have a solution, this is a solution for epsilon n, you also have a minus epsilon n solution, right? So this is your gamma of minus epsilon n. You would find out that this is actually equal to gamma dagger of epsilon n. Okay. So you have this condition. Right, so this is kind of a uh, important uh, condition, let's say. Let's just put it inside a box. Right. So this is the this is what you what you know what we mean by when we mean a Majorana fermion. Okay. So there is a key thing. So, which means that basically any quasi particle in a, inside a superconductor is a Majorana fermion. Okay, so it's sometimes we call them both condensed matter people call them Majorana quasi particles. So now, um, and the more important thing is that if you look at these, uh, you know, the commutator relations of this gamma ends, you would find out that they satisfy the same commutation relations as your psi, right? If you they anti commute. You know, then if you if you have you know if you have to make change and so on and so forth, okay. As long as you look at only positive energies, and and you know this this kind of this we you know this this fake doubling there. Now um, the key thing is that you know and so that that there in comes a lot of people making mistakes. Like I mean, it's a nomenclature mistakes, but then you know some people who are in the field. They think about, you know, they know this, but then, you know, they, they use sloppy language. And then the people who are a little slightly out of the field, like, I mean, Barry Sanders, for instance, like just a couple of days ago, we're talking about this in, in a mistaken language. You know, it's not my own fermions are fermions. So they, you cannot do quantum topological quantum computing with them. They're fermions. Okay, so that's the that's the key thing. And they've, they've always been around. No one is looking for them. Anytime you're looking for any, under a bound state, whatnot, laying around, you see them. We have zillions of signatures of them, you know, and so on. You know, there's this this Caroline metric and degeneracy, all sort of states that I actually are, you know, have this smile on a character. So now the key thing comes in whenever we're looking. Remember, these solutions have the zero mode, okay? And therein comes the the key thing. So now, for if we have a epsilon equals to zero solution. Okay. Now this condition of being a Majorana, right, it gives us something very special, right? So gamma dagger of zero, right, is equal to gamma of minus zero, right? Minus zero is zero. So it is basically tells you that these operators, right, these particular operators are Hermish. Okay. So now this is the, this is the key thing. That's than called a Majorana zero mode. And if you have them isolated, and this is the elusive particle, right? So if you, now we're gonna see that it actually has statistics which are not fermionic, right? So they're actually non-abelian anions. Okay. 
So that is the that is the key thing, right? So these zero modes are the ones that we want to look for. These zero ones are the ones that we want to achieve, not Majorana fermions. Okay, Majorana fermions are there, but whenever you have quasi particles in a superconductor settings, that's the Majorana fermion. Okay. So now uh, we want to have these zero modes, and remember the zero modes are actually related to this topological index. And whenever you have these, you call that a topological superconductor. Okay. So whenever you have exactly the same thing applies, for instance, if you had a wire, we can discuss if you have time how to make these uh, and what are the things. If it is a topological superconducting wire that goes into some trivial you know, vacuum or some trivial insulator, then what you see is that you see a Majorana zero mode here localized. Now, of course, you can see that the, that's the, that also key is another key. You cannot have a single one of these because they are not. You see that not, they are not fermions. We started out from fermions, so whenever this happens, whenever you have the zero mode, they cannot come in in alone, right? They have to come in pairs, and this is the other one over there. Right. So these are now the gamma zero. If you want uh, gamma of zero, right? This is another gamma of zero here. Let's just call this A and then let's call this B, okay? So now the, the key thing is that you see whenever you whenever this happens, right? You can actually form a fermion, right? Called basically a, a fermion operator basically by combining these guys. You have the gamma A, right? plus i gamma b and then well we divide it by one half right you call this a fermionic operator c okay c there and then you can of course have the same thing gamma a minus i gamma b one half would be c and then you you can immediately show that the c c dagger satisfies fermionic commutation relations now you say, okay, so this is a very good thing. There's something in the chat, maybe I'm missing out anything. Can the zero mode come from the violation of chiral symmetry, existence of chiral anomaly? Can this produce a chiral current in the system, produce a chiral magnetic effect? Okay, so we have to come back to this as, as well because there's a kind of a, a lot of uh, chi chiral uh, nomenclature here. I'll come back to that, but let me just say that Kyle anomaly is happens in, in, in three plus one dimensions. So it is it is a thing of while superconductors, we actually have a work on that to show that you can actually have that. Uh, the chiral magnetic effect. And in and we, then we were looking when you're looking at some sort of well semi-metal or well superconductor in three dimensions and one time dimension. Right. So here what we're looking at is is something like a very, very, very low dimensions based talking about zero dimensional uh, um, stuff that are bound to something, right? The edges of a wire, right? We, we also can see that these are can be, if you have a vortex, they would also be coupled to that and so on. Okay, so now, um, so the key thing here is that, and then I will move on. Let me see how much time I'm having. Um, the key thing is, is that basically, if you have these uh, operators, you see that th this is like another, again, a Fermi operator, but and you can say that any, then I can write any fermion operator like this, and it is true, right? So that is the that is the key thing, right? You can actually write any fermions like that, but here gamma A and gamma B are localized in different points in space. For if you take any electron, you can write this operator as again in its own gamma A and gamma B, right? But that will be localized in the same point where the electron is. Here, the key thing is that they're separated. So that's called electron fractionalization, right? So you, you actually fractionalize an electron, right? So whenever you're looking at locally, there is no electron there. There is no electron here either, but together they form one fermion, which is delocalized at the two ends of the wire, okay? So you basically are splitting electrons, yeah? or you can say that you're splitting the real part of the electron from the imaginary part of the electron, but you know, so that's why we have math. So it's clear what I mean. So now, um, I would like to talk about why these, so, so far so good, right? So this is nothing, you know, this is for since you can write these operators from all, all the electrons, what should be the, what should be the hard part? Um, 
Right, so this is now we're going to show that these operators are actually non abelian anions, and then you can use them to do some, you know, based computation, or, or you can have them do some compute operations. But the key thing here is it's already visible there. You see that uh, you have a state like this, remember from that. So your, your, your ground state of your superconductor, let's say you call that zero. If you write a C dagger, you actually can have another state, let's say one. So you have a fermionic state delocalized at the ends of the wire. When that state is empty, right? So you call that zero. When that state is full, you call that, um, you call that one. So now this is a very special superconductor. It means that basically this ground state, remember the, in terms of its fermion, but typical superconductors we know have ground states that have even number of fermions, that's the uh, Cooper pairs, right? You have these all electrons are paired and then they, they condense and, and then you know nothing, all the single electron excitations have to pay a certain excitation. This is our uh, conventional picture. Now, what happens here is that you basically have a topological superconductor. That's true. There's still that gap, but you actually also have these little mid-gap states that are exactly telling you that you actually have an even number of electron ground state and an odd number of electron ground state. Okay, and they have the same energy. Okay, so now that but there's a key thing. So one obvious thing is that hey, look, I have zero and one. I have a qubit. That is not correct. We have not yet a qubit. And the reason is the following. You cannot superpose right, particles of different fermion number, fermion parities. Right? So this is a very key thing that you cannot. Um, so um, maybe this is kind of a, a similar thing that um, that basically not, not entangling with the vacuum. But it is so here. The important thing here is that you know you basically you know, you have to, con you know, you have to, you know, those fermion numbers are inherently con conserved. And the fermion parity is in a superconductor, you remember the fermion number, you know, the charge and so on are not conversed, con um, uh, conserved, uh, because, you know, you can actually exchange charge with the condensate, with the bosons, but still your fermion parity is conserved, right? So that's the key thing. And the reason is that you basically have a Cooper pair, right? So if you actually, um, you can have a Cooper pair and a hole, right? This can, you can go between this and an electron, right? So basically what you do is that the fermion number here or the fermion parity here and the fermion parity there have to be equal, okay? So these two states, zero and the one state have different fermion parity. Therefore you cannot, you know, put them in a superposition and whatnot. Okay, having said that, now let's go back and then imagine now um, how do we actually do this computation, right? So, you, so the main idea is that, so now you actually have a basically, typically people have this wire networks and things like that and, and so on. Um, so, and, you know, we'll, we'll come back to how you can actually braid them and so on. So imagine you have many of them, right? So you have gamma one, gamma two, and so on. Right? Here is the gamma, to n and then you have gamma 2n plus 1, gamma 2n minus 1, and so on. Okay, that, that, that's many of them along the way. All right, so now the important thing is that remember, I can if if I want to describe the state of the system, I always combine them into the CN operators. All right, so the I talk about the I make up a fermion, it's just the basis that I'm used to, so that I would like to use it in that basis. And of course, remember that basis ultimately whenever you're doing any experiments is the basis you would use because those are the basis that you can couple to. In that basis, you can count fermion number as well, okay? So now you do a CN dagger, right? As gamma basically 2N minus one plus I gamma 2N divided by two. And then you have CN is the complex conjugate 2N minus one minus I gamma 2N divided by two, okay? So now uh, you have these two states, right? And then your basis state is, again, would be uh, states that, which are formed by the, these fermions. So C and dagger is a set of fermions, right? Remember, so they might be occupied and unoccupied, right? So whenever you're having a state, uh, let's say you're talking about zero, 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 whatever, zero, 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 zero state, 
you act on it with a CN dagger that gives you a state which is zero, whatever, and only this one at the end point, and then zero, 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 and so on. Okay, so you can so and and the key thing here is that because these are myronas, they're separated, they all have the same energy. So you have a massive degeneracy of your ground state. Okay. So this is the this is kind of the platform you want to achieve. Okay. So suppose you achieve this, how do I actually show that they are um, they are non-abelian? So let's just let's just go there. So now the important thing here is that um, so remember there is an amazing uh, well, there are actually a couple of ways of actually doing this. So, um, so let's just do the following. So imagine now, right? I do something, right, such that they would actually my um, if. Right. So that's that's a big if. If I if these fermions had been at the same point, right? You would actually you could actually give them phases. Okay. Right, that's kind of a gauge freedom, and and basically those are the phases that actually we don't like, right? Because that phase would mean basically um, um, that you actually are you know randomizing your quantum state, and then if you you know that 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 phase that is uncontrolled will actually wash out all your quantum superposition, you know, all the interference effects and entanglement and so on. Okay, this is not good for you. Quantum. Now let's just write down this uh, gamma business like that, right? So I have gamma two and um, minus one, right? Is equal to gamma base D, sorry. Cn dagger plus Cn, right? That is it. And then I have gamma two N, right? So this is basically Cn dagger minus Cn over I, okay? So now I ask myself, like, let's just say that it, and that's the key thing, right? So now, if I make a phase on this fermion somehow, right? Then this would cause a transformation, right? This will become, I have Cn dagger, right? And then I would have Cn dagger times, let's say, e to the i theta, right? That's my phase. And then, but then the Cn would pick up e to the minus i theta. Right, so the same thing here. Right, so let me just go on um, a little bit further. So this would this would be my new fermion. But then I can actually write this as cosine theta times C n dagger plus C n plus basically uh, I times sine theta times C n dagger minus C n. Okay. So now you see that uh, this is a this is a cool thing because now you see that this was my original gamma, right? This is my gamma two and minus one, and this one is basically uh, i times gamma two n. Okay, so now if you make that phase transformation, right, on the on your fermion, what it does on the gammas is something very non-trivial. So it actually have your gamma. 2n goes into gamma 2n cos theta minus gamma 2n minus 1 times sine theta. And then gamma 2n minus 1, I haven't showed you, but you can guess this goes into gamma 2n sine theta plus gamma 2n minus 1 cos theta. Right, so it makes a rotation. So now if, you, if your electron and your gamma n and gamma n plus 1 are on the same point, this rotation is non-trivial. This happens all the time. But if they're separate, you, okay. So whenever you do this, you actually are more effectively like putting in very non-local operation. Remember, so one is here, the other one is there. So that's why the environment is unable to come up with an operator that does this. Okay. So that's the that's key number one to topological quantum computation because the environment cannot do this. It cannot actually operate on your on your quantum state of your system. So now what remains is that we want to show that this actually um, does the trick for our uh, for our uh, braiding operations. So now let's just talk about the braiding operations. Um, the braiding operations actually you see that um, you have a situation, right? So you want to let's say exchange your gamma two n to gamma two n minus one. Right, so the, we're going to start with that, and then we're going to see that actually this one will give us something trivial. 
but we will see that as you go, you get something non-trivial. Now, suppose I want to exchange these guys. All right, so the operator that does this, right, have to do some operation like this when theta is equal to remember. Um, whenever I do, so I want that theta is equal to pi over two. Okay. When theta is pi over two, I have an operation gamma two n goes into minus gamma two n minus one. I have gamma two n minus one goes into gamma two n. Okay. So now this operation, so and that's the key thing because I haven't. So what I so I can describe it as a as a phase and la la la, but that is not good because I want to have a real operator that acts on it, right? So then I can actually generalize to all the stuff, and it turns out. The operation that does this right, is the unitary operation, right? And this is if you want the braiding of basically 2n with 2n minus 1, right? So this is equal to e to the basically pi over 4 times um, gamma 2n, gamma 2n minus 1. Remember, it's a key thing, right? This gamma, their product is anti-unitary, so that's why this is a phase. So the important thing is that you can actually, as homework, show that this produces the transformation. Let's call it star. star with theta is equal to pi over two, okay? So now, because I'm running out of time, I would like to move on. And I would like to show you that this is the, the, the moment that I have this operator, I actually can generalize it to any of the two by exchanging those two particles. This is the operation that changes one particle to another particle, right? So the most general thing, u of gamma n and gamma n, Right, this is equal to e to the pi over four times gamma n gamma n. Okay. Now this is the key thing, right? So I don't know how am I doing on time, so I can show you um, uh, how this goes. At least. Uh, yeah, o, you know. Hocam pardon. dakika falan kaldı. Tamam. Uh, all right. So. Um, Okay, so now the important thing here is that if I'm, you see the, the state, so the moment I have this, right, so uh, the, the only thing that I want to show, actually, I will give you also a hint for the homework, so that's actually pretty good, so also, also a hint for the homework, right, so remember this gamma and if you look at its uh, and gamma m, right, they anti-commute unless they are basically the same operator. Then they have, they don't commute. So which means that basically gamma square is always one. Right? It's an identity. Now this is a this is an important thing. You can actually get them out from the from these relations if you want. If you find them, you know. Uh, if you find them non-trivial. Now, looking at that relation, uh, you have the, uh, you can show the following. So you have gamma n and gamma n. Remember the anti-commute, if you square this, right, you have gamma n, gamma n, gamma n, gamma n, right? n is not equal to n, right? So then I can actually change this one to that one. That gives me a minus sign. Then you have gamma n squared, gamma n squared, which is one. So this is equal to minus one. Okay, so this operator, gamma n, gamma m operator, when they're not the same, right, it squares to minus one, you know, all these operators square to one, so this actually looks very much like a Pauli sigma matrix, right, if you do this expansion, then remember what you, how you show to, to be able to show that, you know, e to the i, uh, to show this spin rotations, you always have to expand the exponential, you do the same thing, right, so, so the expand the exponential, you see that every time that you have an even number of gamma and gamma n to the power even number, you would get minus one to n. And then whenever you go to the odd number, you have something like gamma n, gamma m times something even number. And that gives you a generic thing, 
right? This U, if you have a, um, so let's just say that it's exponential times basically beta times gamma n gamma n, you can actually expand it just like your poly business. That will be basically a cosine beta plus gamma n gamma n times sine beta. Okay. So now you have this operator. You can actually uh, go play around with with stuff. You know, like that's the that's the key thing. Now, for remember for pi over four, right? If this is for beta is equal to pi over four. Right, this would be basically the following, right? So this would be cosine beta would be one over square root of two plus gamma n gamma n over square root. Right, so this would be basically one plus gamma n gamma n divided by square root of two. That would be the operator that exchanges gamma n and gamma n. So now let's just to, to demonstrate your thing, let me just do this real quickly. Um, so now let's just say that I have actually four of them. One, two, three, and four. Remember that these two would make your uh, operator C1, and these two would make your uh, fermion C2, right? And then correspondingly, you have the states like you have the zero fermion state, you have the state with C1 dagger zero, zero, right? Which is basically one, zero. And then correspondingly, you have the zero one state, and then you have the zero one one state, right? Which is basically C one dagger C two dagger on zero zero. Okay, so this would be then the four degeneracy of four in your in your state. Now the key thing is that now suppose I make the transformation one two, right? So the transformation I want to exchange one and two. The operator does that. U gamma one gamma two, right, is equal to one over square root of two. One plus gamma one gamma two, okay? So now this is, you know, you can actually show that this is a phase, which is not surprising because that's just how we came from back from there, right? So that if you have an operator, this actually gives you a phase of, you know, basically remember this is a phase of pi over two. Right, so it's just multiplied by i and so on. So now this is something which is trivial. So if you get this u12 acting on the state 0, 0, you actually get a phase which I will ask you to calculate on that 0, 0. Nothing really changes. Now let's imagine we do the following u23. Now this is something non-trivial because this you cannot you cannot ever do this unless you have stuff that is separated. But you take the, let's say, the real part of this electron and the imaginary part of this electron, and you exchange that. Right. So now comes, and then at any point in this exchange, you can actually make modems apart from each other, so they will never touch. Okay. So now let's see what that operation does. Right. So this operation is one over square root of two, identity operation times gamma two times gamma three. Right, so now what, how do I write gamma two and gamma three? Remember my definition, right? I want to write it in terms of the fermion operators in this, in this form, right? Let me just copy that there. Copy. Paste. Now this is the, let me just put it in a, in a box that I'm gonna use. Now, if I want to write it in this form, right? So my u23 operator, one over square root of two, one plus gamma two is this operator, right? C n, or not in this case, of course, n is equal to one, right? This would be C1 dagger minus C1 divided by i. Gamma three, on the other hand, right? It's an odd operator. So this for n is equal to, again, n is equal to two, right? That would be base dc2 dagger plus c2. And this would be the operator. Now let's see if I act this on the state zero, zero. And so the operator like this, one over square root of two, identity plus c dagger one minus c1 over i times c2 dagger plus c2 acting on zero zero. Now the important thing is that you probably need to see this. This is an annihilation operator, 
on a ground state, so they would be killed, right? So they would not, they would annihilate the state. So I basically have two options. So I would have one over square root of two of the state zero, zero, that's coming from the identity. And these are the states that are basically plot, like we basically have, um, um, you basically have the, the thing, which is plus times one, one. Okay, so there's something in the chat. Hashtag could help. Okay, so that's already, I'm, I'm afraid that might probably even finished. Um, so now, but I'm at a point that I can now talk to you about. This is like a typical situation of mult pari al kare, right? It's the, it's the thing of cups. So what you do is that you start out with a state, right? So you have these fermions um, here, right? So now you basically you you basically term, germinate them from vacuum, right? So you have the states zero. You start out with a state of even fermion parity. You have no extra fermions around. You start these two myron fermions, gamma one and gamma two. Together they form a fermionic state, delocalized, and you know they have no fermion in that state. You have gamma three and gamma four, also a state like that. There's another fermion there. So this is C1, this is C2, and both states are fermionic states are empty. Now you take this, make this operation, you take you know, gamma two and move that here, gamma three and you move that there, right? You move that operation at any point. Now your state of this being from zero, zero, goes into a superposition of zero, zero plus one, one. So it can be that I made a, a sign convention somewhere that you might have a, a minus one corresponding to this as well. It really doesn't matter because it depends on which direction you actually move that. So now, I mean, that, that's, the, that's an amazing thing. Now you, you start it out as, as no fermions from anywhere. You just move this around and all of a sudden you have a superposition of of now uh, fermion and no fermion. So now if you want to measure this, for instance, you can bring them again back together, right? Together they form, you know, they were delocalized fermion, then they're on top of each other, they become something measurable, right? You can measure the charge and, and so on, that sort of thing. You make a charge measurement and you find out that not all the time you see no fermion. So you basically started having a situation where you have fermion. And then you actually started making a, some sort of a very strange looking state. So now the key thing here is that this is a basically um, it, it is basically is a, is a is a gate operation, and this is a gate operation that it is in a sense topologically protected, right? So the key thing here is that as long as your gap is large enough and your system you can operate the system basically uh, by moving them around, um, you can uh, generate this operation. Right? This is if you want, this is a qubit operation. This four Majoranas form one qubit because you know you have a fermion parity. So this is the operation that you can do is only between zero, zero and one, one. Plus you can actually have these phase change operations on zero, zero and one, one. Right? Those are the four things that you can do here. Now, but if you have eight, you have two qubits, you can actually start moving various gammas from one to the other. And that will actually start entangling them. You see that the, what's coming out is extremely complicated stuff. So that's what they call braiding. Right, it's like a braiding such reducer, right? You have these electrons, basically, you know, you have those myron fermions coming out up there, and then you basically are, are moving them around in, in various, you know, ways. This can, can maybe do nothing. And then you can get this one over this, this can go out, and then you can have this one now coming that way, this can go here, and so on, you know, like, so you can actually make this move as basically time uh, goes by, right? So now you can actually start from a quantum state here and then you actually, you can of course have many of these and you can see that by making those operations, you can actually end up with a, with a state that you desire, right? Or, and the whole, remember the, the whole point of quantum computation is that you want to be able to control operations on, on, your, part, on, your, on your quantum state. Here, the key thing is that uh, there is a big, uh, problem, there's a kind of, if you want, is a, is a contradiction in quantum, you know, um, computation, you want to be able to couple well to the system enough that you want to operate on it, but you don't want the system to couple to the environment so that the environment doesn't operate. Here, this way, you actually can actually have achieved both worlds, you basically can operate on it in a very controlled deterministic manner, 
by changing the position of those uh, things by using actually gates and so on. And then, and that was the, the, the key idea. So if you, if you ask me later on, I can tell you about what the recent developments and this retraction business and so on. Um, so now, um, and then you can actually, by making these operations, while you're doing that at any point, your state is protected. So now there's this one key question. So, and okay, so this is now your final homework. So how do you actually transform? And this is a key thing. Just if you suppose you want to transform one and three, they're not right next to each other, right? So how do you do it? You can actually show that this is equal to u dagger one, two, u two, three dagger, and u one, two. By making these operations in the say it sounds sense show, this is show this. By making only the nearby operations, you can actually make it in your operation to in global operations and everywhere. So that's the that's the key thing. So now there is one key question: is that can you do universal quantum computation with only these operations? The answer is no. There's one operation missing. Okay. So that's and that's the. Uh, of course, you can of course do this operation whenever you bring those qubits together. But and there are people proposes that people want to do this in a very. Uh, in a protected manner, but yet there is no topologically protected way of getting this final missing piece operation. Okay, so that's the, uh, and that's the kind of the golden, let's say, uh, holy grail um, that we want to find, right? So this is, the, this is the key thing. So if you actually have it, you actually answer the question that definitely guys at Microsoft wants to be answered. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop here. If they have any questions, I can answer them. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Financial uh, Jump. Are there any questions you can directly ask or I can mediate the uh, questions? Any questions, anyone? So I can actually answer Özgür's question. So you, you see, these are. Uh, people like to use low dimensional stuff because they have more control over this thing so that's the wire network but you can actually have let's say stuff like uh, basically vortices they will be also locked to the vortices you can actually move if you can move them around there but moving vortices around is not as easy as like basically putting some gates to basically push these uh, extensions around so that's why people like this idea of this nano wires and things like that now people talk about those hinge states and so on. So they want to use that for uh, these type of things and so on. So they, I mean, so the, the once once this door is open, basically you have a um, lot of topological stuff coming in. You need an isolated low dimensional state and then you want to be able to proximitize that state with uh, superconductivity. So that's the that's the basically the key thing uh, technologically. I haven't talked about that. Yes, I think I can upload the lecture notes. I think we have a drive, I think. I, I don't know where it is, but I can I can put it on that drive. Okay. Um, so everything was crystal clear. Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> Let me so if you have any questions later, maybe you can also email uh, in Antroja. If uh, oh yeah, I, I think maybe I should write my email, right? So um, yeah, maybe that let me write my email here. Uh, it's not really working. I'm just hold on. Um, so let me just write here. So it's on the notes that everybody can reach if they're looking at the notes as well. Um, email sorry i missed the uh, in line transfer but uh, as far as i understand it gives you more control at low dimensions right in a nutshell uh, it gives you more control and you be, I mean, the key thing is that gives you control if you have a, I mean, because you can actually put gates on, you can control with gates and people have, of course, you know, because of semiconductor industry, we have, people feel comfortable with gates, right? Moving vortices around is not easy. And there are actually things like that because you have this Josephson vortices as well, not our old 
good old abricosa vortices that are laying around. But you can also have this thing so-called Josephson vortices, and that happens in this Josephson junction. Those actually, you can also use them to, to do stuff. But, you know, that's all, you know. There's lot, lots of actually amazing stuff is happening here. Like people have this Josephson junction networks on top of the, you know, this topological insulators and then doing these things by moving, trying to move towards and all, all sort of crazy stuff. All right, that's it. Let oh, me just uh, stop the share.